Great to see you guys. Good to have you guys here. Uh, I just want you to know that when, uh, like, when Carl asked that question, what your favorite Christmas movie is, Dale and I turned to each other at the same time we said Die Hard. So, so yeah, that tells you everything. But we don't watch those movies because we're Christians, right? Um, good morning. It's good to be with you guys. If I haven't gotten a chance to meet you, my name is Steve. I serve as the campus pastor at Valley Christian Schools. I get to teach here. And we are in a series called Honest Advent. And in this series, we've been considering the humanity of Christmas. And a few weeks ago, Pastor Dale opened up our series with a bit of an outline in the shape of a nativity. So, of course, I had to bring our nativity, right? So in this, as you guys all know, we have uh, Mary, we have Joseph, and then we have the baby Jesus. Oh, I, I'm glad he was attached. That could have been real bad, okay? <laughs> Uh, tells you who actually sets up our Christmas decorations here. But in this series, we've been leaning into sort of the discomfort that we see when we look at the Christmas story from a place of honesty and what's actually happening here in the story. And we began with Mary as Pastor Christie unpacked how God strips away at this deep and profound insecurity that we all have as human beings. And it's around that question, are we enough? And I love that the story of Mary is about how God accomplishes his purposes through the least of these. And then last week, we heard this incredible sermon by Pastor Danny that was on basically three words, she gave birth. Now, I don't know if you ever have been a part of that process. You know that birth is messy, it's risky, it's vulnerable, and on some level, it's traumatic. The birth of my oldest, definitely that traumatic. But it's this incredible act of love that the creator of the universe would step into all of that messiness and that trauma because that is how he steps into our human story. Now for me, as I look at the story of Christmas, I resonate with this messiness and the complexity that we see in the Christmas story because I believe that this is all a parallel of our actual human experience. You see, to me, an odd, the honest advent actually gives people for whom this season is not full of joy and peace and hope. But maybe as they step into this season, they feel a sense of difficulty and contention and maybe even a sense of loneliness. In fact, I wonder if even as we look at this nativity scene, there's a bit of this scene that causes a little bit of pain. It's painful for those who want a family and can't have a family, or they maybe have lost a family, or they come from a dysfunctional family. And one of the things that happens in our culture is that rather than inviting God to come and meet us in that space to help us work through some of that difficulty in our culture, we tend to medicate it, right? We say, hey, let's do a little bit of retail therapy. Have you guys heard that before, right? Or we may even choose to minimize the story. That instead of what we end up doing is we end up focusing on the pageantry of the season. We start adding like little sheep and little things here to kind of distract and make this whole scene just a little bit more pleasant. But what I found out is that we actually even try to minimize what's actually happening in the story. And so my wife, Kate, revealed to me that now there is what they call a minimalist nativity. I think I have a picture of it right here coming soon. There, there it is. The minimalist nativity. Now, I, there are lots of things I love about being a millennial. This is not one of those things, okay? Where we're like, hey, if this scene of a family makes you so uncomfortable, let's just turn them into indescript blocks. This is the gospel according to Jenga, okay? And uh, I want you to be happy to know that you can own <laughs> one of these block sets for 210 British pounds, which those of you guys who don't know, that's about $266.47, okay? Just to do the little math. But see, this is sort of what happens here in this season, that when we look at the Holy Family, if this scene evokes too much pain, isn't it so true that in our culture what we do is we try and minimize it and, and rather than face what is causing the pain, that we end up creating something new to make it a little bit less painful. You see, the good news about an honest advent is that the Christmas story is about a God who doesn't shy away from the messiness of our human experience and even our family structures. And so today we're gonna turn to probably one of the most complicated relationships that we have in our life. And that is the relationship that we have with our fathers. 
Now I know that even as I even mention the word father, that a lot, it's gonna evoke a bunch of different kinds of emotions. That for some of us, maybe our relationship with our father is great. But for some of us, maybe we feel this sense of longing, this sense of pain when it comes to our father. I caught myself kind of talking with my friend Andrew this week about my sermon and he was like, gosh, like we were having this conversation and I was like, man, I can't wait for the day that when I talk about fathers and I talk about fatherhood that I don't have to give a long list of disclaimers like it's the end of a pharmaceutical commercial, right? You see, all of this is complicated by our cultural narratives about our fathers. Like think about how we portray our fathers in our culture. Uh, you think about TV and TV dads, right? And so I've got a photo of some of our TV dads here, but our TV dads are often aloof or absent, inaccessible, or they're harsh, right? And so you have uh, somebody like Ray Romano from Everybody Loves Raymond, Homer Simpson or Peter Griffin, or back in the day, Ted Bundy, right? They're perceived as fools. Or they're like Red from that 70s show where they're harsh, maybe they're vulgar, or maybe even emotionally distant. Now, obviously, there are some great TV dads out there. The ones that I think of and remember are obviously Carl Otis Winslow, right, from The Family Matters, or uh, Philip Banks from The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, or for those of you who are non-millennials, Phil Dumphy, okay? So, okay, captured everybody there. There are some great dads in there. Now, obviously, all of these dads are caricatures, but all of these characters and these caricatures, don't they point to a deeper longing that we all have of our fathers? something that we desire. And whenever there is a gap and they don't meet up to our expectations, that it ends up creating a sense of a gap. You see, all of this points to this desire that we all have for a dad who is present and loving and affectionate and uplifting. And I know this is a little controversial if you were a kid, but even corrective, right? That God cares about us too much to leave us as we are. And the reason why I say this is because this isn't a Christian people thing. This isn't a religious people thing. This is just a human thing. In fact, the sociologist Brad Wilcox said in the Atlantic uh, article, he says this. He says, contrary to what Jennifer Aniston believes, the data shows that dads are indispensable in today's world and bring more to the family structure and to the parenting enterprise than just money. According to Pew Research, 70% of people who live in the U.S. believe that a child needs to have a father in the home in order to grow up happy. And I share all this because there's something innate within us, within our humanity, that holds on to this desire and a hope that we have for our dads. And when it comes up short, or our dads are absent, or that trust is abused or broken, that it creates a sense of longing. And more often than not, what happens is we end up projecting those shortcomings onto God. And so in psychology, there is this word called transference, that our relationships with our dads affect everything from our sense of safety, security, and the ability to trust, and even our own sense of worth. And what happens if we don't pay attention to that? We fall into a transference trap that we end up projecting onto God that looks a little bit like this that we need to achieve for God's attention, that we have to earn God's love by doing and by striving, that God is uninterested in us, that God is far off and distant from our lives or that he just doesn't care or that God is cruel and critical waiting for us to fail so that he can punish us. But perhaps the most painful is that God is absent and inaccessible and at the very end of the day, God just doesn't exist. The psychologist Sigmund Freud observed this spiritual transference best when he said this, nothing is more common than for a young person to lose faith in God the day that he loses respect for his father. What's interesting to me is that rather than looking at God as the image of a perfect father that we long for, that we can actually strive to become like, we look to our imperfect fathers and project that onto God. So my hope today as we look at the story of Joseph and we look at the Christmas story from his perspective, is to do sort of a reverse transference, to see that God is actually not a projection of our imperfect fathers, but that God is actually the perfection of what we hope for in our earthly fathers. And when we find all of our sense of identity and worth and acceptance and security and trust in a perfect heavenly father, it actually allows us to see our imperfect earthly fathers with compassion and empathy and maybe even mercy. 
And so today, as we unpack the Christmas story from Joseph's perspective, we're going to look, and hopefully what you get a chance to see is actually the character of God. And to help me today, I'm going to invite up my daughter Evangeline to come up, and she's going to do our reading. And so if you have your Bible, uh, turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. Halfway through your Bible, you can open up, flip right past all the hard to read Hebrew names. Stop when you get to the names of your homies, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew's number one. We're going to be in chapter 1. Evangeline Dang, everybody. This is how the birth of Jesus Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph before they came together. She was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit because, Jace, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to the public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home is as your wife, because what is conceived her, in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Jesus, when Joseph's woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and, she, and he gave him the name Jesus. Matthew chapter 2, 13 through 15. The escape to Egypt. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother to escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod, and was so fulfilled with the, the, what the Lord had said, and Lord had said, and through the prophet, out of Egypt I call my son. Good job. All right, Evangeline, everybody. Uh, her debut on stage. It was so wonderful. Okay, guys, I'm done. I'm so proud. Um, so cool. Um, Joseph is sort of a forgotten figure in the Christmas story, isn't he? Like, and this is evidenced by the fact that I can think of so many songs that involve, that have lyrics around Mary, right? You think about uh, Mary, Did You Know? Or the lyrics like Round Young Virgin, Mother and Child. But how many songs can you think about Joseph? Right, like I had to dig way back in the archives around the year early 2000 by a song written by a non-Christian, Dave Matthews, in the Christmas song. Right, it was sitting there, back there, in the year early year 2000, sitting right next to my puka shell necklace, okay? <laughs> now we don't know much about Joseph, but we do know that he is from Bethlehem. And in Matthew 13, 55, we learn that he is the son of a carpenter. Notice that even in this passage that he doesn't say that Jesus is the son of Joseph. In fact, Scripture goes on to say that the people who come to Jesus say, hey, isn't Jesus' mother Mary? Which would have been an ultimate slap in the face that they would name the mom and not the dad. Now, tradition tells us that Joseph probably died before Jesus began his earthly ministry, which is one of the reasons why we probably don't see that he's mentioned again. And yet, in Joseph's story, without his commitment to God, his obedience and his constant presence and his courage, there would actually not be a Christmas story. And this is incredibly surprising that we don't hear more about him in this season, considering the fact that Matthew captures a unique announcement that is directly revealed to Joseph that connects the identity and the mission of Jesus to Old Testament, prophet, uh, Old Testament promises. And so today I want to look at just a few observations from Joseph's actions. And what I hope that this reveals is actually the character of God. And so the first thing that we see in Joseph's story is that he was committed to a life of true honor and an all-in faith. And so in verse 18, we see that he was engaged to be married to Mary. And last week, Pastor Chrissy said that she was probably around the age of 13, or two weeks ago, around the age of 13 and 15. Now in Jewish tradition, it wasn't uncommon for marriages to be arranged and for families to commit their children to one another at an early age. And so they were engaged. And before they had any kind of sexual intimacy, Mary 
got pregnant. Now for Joseph, this would have been incredibly awkward. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 23 to 27, that part of what happens if an engaged woman ends up becoming pregnant by somebody that isn't her fiance, this sin was so shameful that it was actually punishable by death. And I want you to notice here that Joseph was faithful to the law. And yet what I circle and underline is that phrase, and, and yet. He was faithful to the law, and yet. You see, Joseph knew the Old Testament law that Mary could be killed, although this would have been incredible, like highly unlikely because the Romans had taken over and they had outlawed all forms of capital punishment unless it was on their terms. But it does give us insight into the weight of shame and dishonor that this whole situation would have created in her community. Could you imagine the whispers that she must have overheard as she was walking through Lenardi's, right? <laughs> this woman should be dead, but why is she walking around? You see, Joseph chose honor and mercy. And rather than subject her to public scrutiny, and when I think about this public scrutiny, I think about way back in the day at the Jerry Springer show, like if anyone ever saw those, right, with the paternity test, it's like, you are not the father. And then like everyone's like, oh, right? Like this is exactly what have happened. The reason why they would go and have a whole public uh, embarrassment over Mary is that by Mary getting publicly embarrassed, this would have saved his own reputation. But instead, she says that Joseph had in mind to divorce her quietly with a certificate of divorce. Now in verse 20, it says that Joseph considered this. And the original language of the New Testament, this is an incredibly rare word. It only shows up three other times in the New Testament. And what it does is it conveys this idea that Joseph had a deep wrestling over something that required action. Have you ever tossed and turned in the middle of the night over a decision about what the right thing to do was, right? Maybe that decision was like 24 hours away and you're like, oh, I'm not sure what's happening here. Well, this is what this word is actually conveying is that he was deeply wrestling with the right thing to do. But an angel appears to him in a dream and says, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're a Bible circler or underliner, you can circle and underline that phrase, do not be afraid because all kinds of bells should be going off in your head because it follows a distinct pattern that we see all throughout the Old Testament. That whenever you see the phrase, do not be afraid, it's just before whoever that, that phrase is being spoken to is about to do something that is incredibly difficult or impossible without God. It's the same phrase that's said to Abraham before he was called, Moses before he led God's people out of Egypt, Joshua before they entered in the promised land, David before he ascends to the throne, Isaiah as he's living in exile. And so in each case, you see this pattern that just before God is about to call someone to do something that seems impossible, that God says, do not be afraid. And here God is about to step into human history and he's entrusting Joseph with a task that will risk his reputation, his own life in order to serve God's purpose. You see, what we need to know about Joseph's story is this, is that while Mary was chosen, Joseph had to choose. Joseph had to choose to opt in to God's plan. Mary was chosen amongst women but Joseph had to choose to believe in the details that were revealed to him about Jesus that wasn't revealed to anyone else. Because Joseph has revealed the identity of the mission of Jesus and now he's given a choice. It's a difficult choice, but the reality, it's a choice that we all have to make ourselves. And that choice is this. Do we believe God enough to risk and give everything, including our very selves? And so he's revealed, Mary will give birth to a son. They will give him the name Jesus, which means Yah. Yahweh is the name of God. Yahweh is salvation. This is revealed only to him. And so the angel goes on to say in verse 22 that all of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. They will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Again, I want you to circle that word fulfill because it means to complete something that has been in the works for a really long time. The way that I like to think about this is like an engaged couple who spends for months planning and preparing for a wedding and now they're at this moment where they're getting ready to walk down the aisle and everything that there is to be done is already done. There's nothing that they can do about anything that isn't ready yet, right? And so what this passage is saying is that all of this has been leading up to this very moment. 
And the name Emmanuel is really interesting because this used to be something that confused me is that why would they call Jesus Emmanuel if we actually call him Jesus, right? <laughs> You're like, that makes zero sense. But really what's happening is that's more like a title that people are gonna say the way that Jesus lives, the way that Jesus shows up, the way that he teaches, the way that he cares is gonna feel like God's presence is actually with us. You see, Jesus is about to fulfill the entire story of God. And the whole story of God is God's desire to be with us from the garden to the fall, that God would stop at nothing to be in relationship with us. And now Jesus' presence is literally God's presence with us. That we don't have to search for God. We don't have to seek for God. We don't have to work for God. We don't have to get his attention. But in Jesus, God has come to us. And this is what Joseph has to choose to believe. And the very next line is something that I love because in verse 25, it says, he woke and he did. He didn't mull it over. He didn't think about it. He didn't have to like really process it. And this is completely contrasted to his wrestling earlier in verse 20. And so the second observation that we see in Joseph's life is this, is that he was committed to a life of obedience no matter what. You see, no matter how you cut it, following Jesus is going to require courage. Whether it's the courage to admit that you are a sinner in need of a savior, or the courage to walk out your faith in a culture that may, faint, find, may find us a little bit peculiar. Faith requires courage. And here in Joseph's story, it's the courage to follow what God has called him to do. Now, if you're anything like me, but I assume that God, if God is gonna call me to anything, then I want all the things right? Like I want the angels to show up. I want there to be a clear sign. I want there to be a roadmap. I want there to be a strategy. God, God if you're going to call me to this, I want to make sure that everything is laid out. It's got to be clear, simple enough for an idiot like me to understand. And there needs to be a roadmap that makes it really easy. But what I've experienced in my 22 years of following Jesus is that when God calls us to something, rarely is it ever easy, nor is it ever really clear. And I think the reason is this. It's because God wants us to fully rely on him in the process and give him credit when it's completed. He wants us to fully rely on him in the process and give him credit when it's completed. You see, in throughout the pattern of scripture, if God wants to be so clear as to send an angel, then you better believe that what lays ahead is going to be impossible without him. It's going to be anything but easy. And for Joseph, as a husband and soon-to-be adoptive father of Jesus, he had to courageously obey God's calling in an honor and shame culture, knowing all the whispers that were going to take place in the barbershop, the tweets and the comments. And when it was time for the baby, we see that he went back to his hometown in Bethlehem. And Bethlehem is actually his tiny little town in the middle of nowhere, which meant that everyone would have known their entire story. Joseph is one of them. And yet, why is there no room at the inn? You see, I wonder if the reason why they rejected him is because they felt so much shame around their situation. And as if it wasn't already difficult to try and give birth to a child and keep that child alive, in the very next chapter, we see that the megalomaniac Herod, whose palace walls, which, I've completely st which I have actually stood on, looks down on the little town of Bethlehem so he could see it from his palace, is so threatened by this talk of a king who is born that he's going to search and kill every male baby in that town. And in verse 13, an angel appears again to Joseph, giving him this warning. And I want you to just look at what it says in verse 14. It says, the angel tells him, hey, get up. And in verse 14, he got up and left in the middle of the night. And it really conveys this idea that whatever the angel says, he does immediately. The, the angel commands him to get up, which is the same words that we see in, in his actions. He got up. And in Greek, it's this word agiro. And it conveys this idea that Joseph did exactly what was told. And so it's interesting actually to note that throughout Matthew's gospel, whenever we see the word agiro, it's actually paired up with this instances in which our human capacity reaches its limit and then God now has to step in with his power. And so just to give you some examples of this, the first example that we see is in Matthew chapter eight. The disciples are in the middle of a storm. If you guys remember, they get scared and they tell Jesus, Jesus, agiro, get up, we're going to drown. So what does Jesus do? Jesus, Agiros, he gets up and he calms the storm. Matthew chapter 9, the crowds gather around. They say, who can forgive sins and tell a paralytic to walk, to, Agiro, to, to get up and walk? 
This would be impossible. But in response, Jesus says, Agiro, get up and walk, take your mat and go home. And then Matthew 27, 28, Pilate is so worried that Jesus' followers are gonna steal his body and claim that Jesus has Agiro raised from the dead, which would be impossible. In the very next chapter, what happens? Jesus is raised up. He's a gyro. He's raised up from the dead. So why does all of this nerdy stuff matter? Okay, you're like, wow, that was a nice little nerdy detour. But here's why this matters. Have you ever felt like you've been given a burden that you didn't sign up for? That you've been given a task that feels so impossible, that God was asking you to do something that felt so difficult? Maybe for you, it's going that you are going to have a baby and you're wondering, what am I going to do? You're a first-time parent. Or maybe for whatever reason, you find yourself having to raise a family all by yourself. Or maybe you've received this diagnosis that completely turns your life upside down and you feel completely overwhelmed in that moment. Well, maybe in that moment, God is saying, Aguero, I got you. Get up, keep walking. Maybe in that moment, like Joseph, all we can simply do is to get up and take the right next step forward in obedience and trust God for what's next because God is with you. My last observation in this story is this, is that we see the power of God in the imperfections of Joseph. And one of the things that I love about Joseph's story is all of these deeply human moments. We don't hear more about Joseph until Jesus is about a sixth grader. And when Jesus is a sixth grader, they end up going to Jerusalem, they're in the temple, and all of a sudden they lose Jesus, which think, like as a parent, if you ever lost your kids, I lost my kids at the A Stadium one time, terrifying, right? I'm glad this happened to Mary and Joseph as well. Felt more human. (laughs) But they go and they're searching all over for Jesus. They find Jesus in the middle of the temple. And then they're like, why did you do this? Like we were searching all over for you. And what does Jesus say? He turns around and he says, didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? And what strikes me about what Jesus says is actually how Joseph must have perceived that. What do you mean? Like, I'm, I've been your adopted father, like, your whole life, you know? Like, obviously, I don't think that Jesus was being an annoying teenager, like, flipping his hair. He's like, Dad, you just don't understand, okay? Like, <laughs> I don't think Jesus was doing that. But I think Jesus was actually conveying his ultimate obedience to the will of God. But I think it captures the experience and the fears of any parent, step-parent, adoptive parent, or foster parent. And it's this fear that letting go of our kids and entrusting the God to God is one of the most difficult things that we can do. You see, Joseph wasn't a perfect father, but he was a faithful father. And if he, as an imperfect earthly father, can go to great lengths to do this for his family, imagine how far God would go to you and me. You see, throughout Scripture, God uses this metaphor of him as a father and also as a mother to his people, knowing that our relationship with our parents is complex. But God wants us to look at him as an image of what a perfect parent or a perfect father actually looks like to recognize that it's only through him, it's only he that can live up to our standards and our expectations and our hopes from our fathers. And that no earthly dad, no matter how good your earthly dad is, can fulfill what we actually long for. And so some of the passages that we read around this season, Isaiah 9, 6 says this, for to us, a child is born, a son is given, the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father and prince of peace. I love that God is an everlasting father because it means that he can't die, he won't abandon us, and he won't leave us when we fail. Luke chapter 15 tells this famous story called the prodigal son, although I think it's a misnomer because the story is not about how a son squanders his life. It really should be called the story of the radical love of the father or something that is way more catchy than that, right? Because the truth is that there's nothing that God won't do to bring us back into relationship with him. It's why the Apostle John will say in 1 John 3, see what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God because that is what we are. And the truth is that when we start looking at our earthly fathers through God's eyes, it leads us to a place of compassion and empathy and even mercy. Um, this, is my, this is my dad. I have a photo of my dad here. Uh, his name is Sung Van Ding, but Americans called him Bob. Okay, I don't know why. Uh, 30 years ago today, and I didn't realize this, but 30 years ago today, he passed away. Uh, I was about eight or nine years old, and uh, I actually don't remember that much about my dad because he passed away when I was so young. And what I do remember from my dad isn't necessarily good. Um, What I do remember of my dad is that he worked a ton. 
What I do remember about my dad is that when he got angry, he got real angry, okay? <laughs> and so there was this part of me that just kind of was like, yeah, I just feel really disconnected from my father. But a couple years ago, my mom actually ended up telling me a story that I had never heard about my dad ever before. And it was this, is that when they were trying to get out of Vietnam, the collapse of Saigon was imminent. My mom and my sister and my dad were down at the airport, but my mom and my sister had papers. But my dad, since he was born in the middle of some village in Vietnam, they didn't have paperwork. And so at the time when they were getting ready to leave, they were like, well, they have, you know, like my mom and my sister, they have papers so they can get on the airplane and leave. But my dad had this difficult choice that he had to make. And so he said to my mom and my sister, like, just get on the plane and I will come find you. And then they took off and then he had to figure out what he was going to do. And so what he ended up doing was he ended up hopping from boat to boat, going from country to country. He ended up landing in Canada, finding out where my mom's family was, and they reunited in Los Angeles, California. It took him over a year to find my family. My dad was imperfect. He made a lot of mistakes. But if he can withstand the robberies, the cold, literally getting here with nothing on his back to be reunited with his family, how much more would a perfect loving God who desires nothing more to be in relationship with us and would stop at nothing, including sacrificing himself to be in relationship with you. And so today I want to end with just three invitations and a prayer because I believe that today we all have a step to take. And the first invitation is this. It's the invitation to actually step into a relationship with God. This is probably the most important thing. If you don't hear anything else, and maybe you're here and you've never made that step, this is the most important step, to step into that relationship with him. And maybe for some of you who are here, and if you were like me, the reason why I rejected God for so long is because of an imperfect parent. Maybe it's because of an imperfect Christian, or maybe it's around imperfect people. But I want to just encourage you that rather than projecting your imperfect experience of humans and flawed human beings onto a perfect God, that you would allow a perfect God to fulfill the things that people can never fulfill by stepping into a relationship with him. And you can do that today with just a very simple prayer. And I put that on uh, the screen here. And it's just this, Jesus, today I trust you with my life. I trust you with my life. That's it. The second invitation that we have is an invitation to healing. And for some of you here today, maybe you've been looking at flawed human beings to fulfill something that you just never got in return. And it's caused you to become resentful or maybe even bitter. Or maybe there are some words or a series of words that someone has said to you. And now they stick into your heart like a sharp barb. And every time somebody flicks it, it feels painful like it happened for the very first time. I want to encourage you that maybe today is the first day that you start to give that over to Jesus. Or maybe you've been waiting for that word of affirmation of security and trust and worth. Somebody to just tell you, hey, everything's going to be okay. And you've been looking for that in another human being, but it doesn't, it doesn't seem to just happen or it doesn't ever come. Well, maybe today your first step of healing in a very long journey is to start by giving it to God. And what you need to hear from your heavenly father today is this, is that you're worthy, that you're enough, that he's proud of you, that you're loved, that you matter and he's got you. Maybe today you need to start receiving that from your heavenly father. And a simple prayer for you today is this. Today, I give you my fill in the bank, blank. Maybe you could fill in that blank with today, I give you my wounds, my bitterness, my anger, my hurt, my loneliness, my frustrations. The third invitation that we have today is actually an invitation to action. And a part of me kind of even wrestled with this, but I actually really felt like God was kind of asking me to lean into this. But I just want to talk for a quick moment to all of the guys that are here in the room. Okay, all of the dudes, my good. Wait, we're all in this boat together, right? Here in this room, but it's also applicable to women. But God just kind of really laid this. But one of my favorite parts about Joseph's story is that Joseph was an adoptive father. He was an adoptive father. After my dad died, God provided father figures in my life before I ever even knew that I needed a father figure. And he did it in the life of the church. That it was in the life of the church that I met people like Mark and Chris Frazier and Sam Earp and even our very own Dale Gustafson, who are all imperfect, especially Dale, okay? <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. But they simply just say yes to investing in just another person 
They follow an example that has been set from the very foundations of the early church in the relationship between the Apostle Paul and Timothy or Silas. And it's one of the things that made church so compelling to me and why I to this day love working with students. Because I know that even just being present and even just showing up, you don't need to be perfect can make a tremendous amount of difference. And what I've discovered that after COVID, during COVID, even before that, there is a famine in godly mothers and godly fathers who want to be a mentor to kids. Our kids are struggling with their identity, with addictions, their sense of worth. And I wonder how many of those things can be met by a loving and caring adult who just wants to say, you know what, you are worth spending time with. Our middle school group and our high school group are awesome. And while I love Jacob and Anna and I love Miranda, they are not enough. But they are built, building this ministry that requires a team of volunteers who are also imperfect, who are just going to say, you know what? I don't know how to do this, but I'm just going to say yes. I'm just going to show up. Okay, you're welcome. Plug. Okay. But it doesn't just have to be youth group. Okay. So just you're thinking, oh, the only way to serve God is in the youth group although slightly true, just kidding. <laughs> My encouragement would be just find some place to serve as just a first step. Maybe you've just been attending for a while and you're gosh, I love the service, I love being here, but maybe your next step is to figure out a place to serve. But I just wanna encourage you, pray about where God's spirit is leading you to take action because when God speaks, may it be like Joseph, you begin to explore and start to see how God meets you in that place. And so a simple prayer for you today is this, is Jesus, I'm here. Show me where you can use me. And with that, would you just join me in prayer? Father, I want to thank you that you are a good, um, good father. And although that creates all kinds of expectations and all kinds of things that we think about, the reality is that our imperfect fathers are not something that we should be projecting onto you. But rather, you are, a perfect, you are the perfection of what we long for and what we hope for in our earthly fathers. And so thank you for being a God who cares about our worries and our weights. And in this season, whatever it is that we are carrying, we invite you to come and meet us and that you would speak to us in a unique way. To speak to us in a way that truly gives us peace and hope and a sense of your deep love for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.